and it's my it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you all to our webinar tonight where we are going to discuss a very important topic that basically touch it's not mine it's yours <laughs> Can you hear me, please? Ah. Yes, yes, you can hear. Okay. Um, I would like to ask all of you, please, to keep your uh, speaker on mute. So this will not interrupt the speaker when she is going to present her lecture. Uh, we are going to touch base on a very important topic tonight. We're going to talk about team steps. I believe some of you are already familiar with team steps, and some of you will learn a very quality and communication tool to enhance patient care more dynamic. Okay? So, with all of my. With all my pleasure to introduce our uh, guest speaker tonight, Ms. Nora Shami. Uh, Ms. Nora Shami, she is the nursing supervisor for a new natal intensive care unit at King Abdulaziz Medical City Ministry of National Guard Health Affairs. Uh, Ms. Nora will take us through interactive presentation about the concept of team steps. Uh, after Ms. Nora, you guys are going to ask your questions. In order to ask a question, you can raise your hand or use the chat button. I am going to control that everybody should be mute except the speaker. So this will help us to avoid extra noise. So please make sure that all your microphone are muted. Uh, Ms. Nora, you can start. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much. I would like first to start by uh, saying thank you to Ms. Maha, uh, the head of the nursing chapter in the Saudi Critical Care Society for giving me this chance uh, to speak to you all guys. Can you see my slides? Yes, Nora, we can see. Okay, excellent, alhamdulillah. Okay, so first, uh, thank you again for making the time uh, after your busy shifts or you're in your only day off. Uh, I totally understand we're all in the same boat. So thank you very much. It shows your dedication and your interests in learning about teamwork and uh, team dynamic and how can we help each other as, a, as, a, as one, one team in one unit. Okay, so today we will be talking about team steps. Uh, this is a framework that was developed to help uh, healthcare, not only healthcare worker, actually, any team that's working together in a critical and a risky environment to work together as a team to improve their communication and to reach their goals. So the team strategy basically is, uh, it stands for the following. So team is a team. Step stands for, S stands for strategy and tools to enhance performance and patient safety. So this is what we call team steps. It's a result of more than 20 years of research and uh, practice, and it's implemented uh, across, the, uh, across US hospitals. And it was uh, basically, it was initiated after the several sentinel events and patient harm, a patient complaint. And after all the research, they, they basically concluded that the majority of what we deal with is communication related. And it, this is in all risky environment and all risky in the industry. It's not only healthcare, it can be aviation, it can be healthcare. 
So it was uh, basically adopted in 2016 and it was implemented across uh, the state. Uh, the program was simple initially, only for frontline, and after that it was developed and it has three levels. It has a 45-minute lecture, which is only for the top leaders just to gain their buy-in to the course if they want like to implement it in their area. There is another uh, level, which is a two-day program, which is for frontline uh, like us, frontline staff. Uh, sorry, it's a one day, uh, sorry, one day course for the frontline staff, six to eight hours with exercise and hands on and interactive to get and understand all the tools and all the concepts. And then the third level is a two days program for the master trainer. So if you would like to become a master trainer, you need to attend the two days in order for you to go back and train your team and train your hospital to implement this uh, program. So as I mentioned, it's more than uh, 20 years of uh, practice and research and implementation. It's implementable and it uh, it's, uh, can be used in any setting, in outpatient setting, in home health care, in inpatient, in critical care, in OR. And if you only Google the word team steps, if you put it in Google, you will find hundreds of research and implementation in different settings and it's all proof that it works and it improves patient care and patient safety. So we can start by why team steps? Team steps, because we, as we mentioned, majority of our issues and patient harm is related to, uh, to communication and team performance. What happens is that in, a, in any setting, in any hospital or any unit, you find experts. You have nursing expert, medical expert, uh, sub, other subspecialty, support services. Each one of them is specialized and expert in his area. but. Yeah but we are not expert in working together. So this is where the error happens and where the problem happens and the way, where our patients are harmed. So he, we will start by discussing what are the barriers to team performance? Why do we, do not, we cannot perform as a team? And there's many reasons. This is a list which I believe each one of you experienced one or two or maybe many of them. Uh, inconsistency in the team membership, lack of time, lack of information sharing. Some of us loves to keep the information them, for themselves and not to share it. Hierarchy. And hierarchy is actually uh, our, our situation in healthcare, especially because it's a complex, very complex industry and very complex setting. And you cannot run away from hierarchy. No matter how you try to decentralize it, still there are hierarchy. And this can affect communication and teamwork. Defensive, defensiveness, some of us are defensive. Conventional thinking. Sorry. Uh, different communication style, conflict between the team members, lack of coordination and follow up, distraction, fatigue. You worked four or five shifts in a row with no rest. The workload, uh, additional workload. Um, and currently, what we're going through uh, since the, um, since 2020 is that yeah we are we, we are, our workload doubled and tripled misinterpretation of cues and lack of role clarity. So those are some, some of the examples of the barriers to team performance. Okay. This is the core teamwork, uh, teamwork skills and team steps. So team steps is about four learnable, teachable key skills. Starts with communication, leadership, situational monitoring, and mutual support. Those four key concepts are performed or practiced within the patient care team or within the patient care environment. We should not forget the patient is here and the team is in here. And the skills that we would like to acquire at the end of this course is a knowledge, performance skill, and a change in attitude. What makes up a team performance? So as we mentioned, the four skills, which is a communication, leadership, situational monitoring, mutual support, and the ability to understand what is team, what is the definition of a team, and what is the team structure. Outcome of a team competence. This is the expected outcome at the end of uh, mastering this uh, or understanding this uh, program. Under knowledge, we expect to gain a shared mental model or achieve a shared mental model. 
uh, under attitude, we should be able to uh, practice mutual trust and team orientation under performance, adaptability, accuracy, productivity, efficiency, and safety. Okay, I, ideally, this is an interactive session. This is a six hours course. So usually we, we discuss this, but because of the time li limit, I will just, uh, we will just go through the slides. And so if you say, I want a high performance team, or I define my team as a high performing team or the dream team, you expect them to perform as follow. They should hold a shared mental model. They have a clear roles and responsibility. They have a clear value and shared vision. They op optimize resources. They have strong team leadership. They engage in regular discipline of feedback. They develop a strong sense of collective trust and confidence. They create mechanism to cooperate and coordinate and they manage and optimize performance outcome. Okay, so we will start with the first uh, mod, uh, concept, which is the team structure. We cannot discuss the four critical concepts without this understanding what do we mean by a team. So a team structure, teamwork cannot occur in the absence of a clearly defined team. So to say that we have a good team, your goals should be very clear. You know where you're going, what are your objectives? Understanding a team structure and how multiple teams interact in a critical, uh, is critical for the implementation planning. So we all, we all, all say that we are in a team. We are in NICU team, OR team, surgical team, ward so-and-so team, but do we understand how many teams we have within the same team? It's not only one team. Okay, before we go there, uh, what's the difference between a group and a team? And this is a little bit uh, demonstration of the difference. So a group is a group of people who are working in one area, but each one of them has a different goal, has a different task, different responsibility. They are interdependent. They don't depend on each other. They are there, each one has a different task. They come back and they discuss what did we achieve? They have a common interest, but they have a different individual goals and individual accountability. When you say we are in a team, it's very clear. We have one goal. We have one purpose. We have one thing that we're all aiming towards. Okay. So, uh, so we have a mutual and individual account accountability. What defines a team? You cannot say I'm a team. You're one member. No, you cannot, you cannot work alone to say a team. It should be two or more people who are in, who interact dynamically, interdependently, and adaptability, adaptively. It should they should have a common goal. They the values are very clear. They have a specific roles and responsibility and function, and have time limited membership. It depends depends on the type of team. Some teams have a time limited membership. Some teams no. We have an open, open, open membership. I'm a, I'm a member of all our team. So. Day in and day out, I'm here in OR. Unlike if I'm, uh, if I'm the, let's say, an example. For example, I'm a CCRT. I respond to a CCRT call. I'm part in ward, let's say, in the surgical ward. So I became part of the surgical ward during that performance of the CCRT. But the minute I finish my job and task and I leave, I no longer part of surgical. Now I'm out of that team. Okay. Here are the different teams that we function, and we deal with in a daily basis in our healthcare system. Within that team, within this triangle, the patient is on the top. So we should not forget. One of the, one of the exercise we usually uh, do during this course is we ask the people, the participants, who are your team members? And I'll tell you 90% of the times we forget the patient. No one mentioned the patient or the family. And actually the first member of that team should be the patient and their family. Then we have what we call a core team, coordinating team, ancillary and support services and administration. So who is, who is the, we know who is the patient and we know their family and the, our team will not exist without them. So what is the core team? Who is in the core team? The core team is the, those who have the closest uh, contact for the longer period within the, with the patient. For example, if you are in the ward, it's to be the primary nurse, followed by the physician. Mainly, I think, uh, or the uh, mainly those are the two core team members, because they are directly with the patient. If I will say about the ICU, for example, I give an example of an ICU. A core team will be the nurse, the physician. We also have a respiratory therapist who is there with us twenty four seven. 
So those are our core team. We are always there. Every day you come, every time you come into the unit, you will find a physician, you will find a nurse, you will find an RT. So this is what we call a core team. We always there, we always exist, okay? Then we have what we call a contingency team. So what do you think the con contingency, contingency team is? Um, Ms. Nuna, if you would like it to be an interactive, you can ask the questions and the participants, if they need to answer, they can raise their hand. So we unmute them because if yes. we keep it for them to control the unmute, it will be too noisy. We have more than yes. 56 in the call. Yeah I, yeah, I was worried about the time and as you mentioned, the uh, controlling, but it will be nice if it is interactive. So for contingency team, so let us find out who, who's interested to answer. Well, who do you think is within contingency team? Anybody? Okay, uh, since there are no hands, right? No one raised their hands so far. So within the contingency team, as we mentioned earlier, is it like, you're, uh, yeah, we have Samira. Um, Ms. Samira, unmute yes. yourself, you can answer. Samini? Yes, we can. Uh, I'm thinking that contingency team are the team that replace the core team when it's needed. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Samira. Yes, I agree with you. Uh, the contingency team is, are a, people, a group of people who comes, provide the server, and leave. For example, a CCRT. We mentioned the CCRT or the rapid response team or the code team. So we call them because we have an emergency. They come, they take over, they care for the patient, def definitely with the support of the core, the core team. And the minute their job con is, is concluded, they leave. So this is a group who comes in and out. Another example of a contingency team is your OR team. The patient goes to them for a one hour, two hour, three hours, no matter how long is the period of operation. The minute that procedure is completed, the patient goes back to his core team. So a, conting a contingency team is a group that, uh, that care for a patient for a short period of time or, or limited time. Uh, and then they, they leave after that. Then after that, we have another, we have another, two, uh, three, another three groups, the coordinate, coordinating team. Who, who are the coordinating team? Anybody? So if you wish to answer, you can raise your hand. So Ms. Samira again, Father Samira, unmute uh, yourself. Yeah, a team, a coordinating team that uh, they coordinate the requirement for the care that um, the core team is not responsible for. For example, admission team, um, pharmacy team. Yes. Uh, bed uh, management team, they yes. coordinate the care. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Ms. Samira. Yes, uh, to coordinating team, yes, is people who coordinate. So you're talking about your, as you mentioned, the bed management, your, uh, your uh, admission office, uh, anybody who coordinate the work and coordinate the activity within, uh, within that unit, you can call them with a coordinating team. You can include your charge nurses. I'll say your charge nurses is part of you, the coordinating team. Yeah, they are core team when they are doing clinical bedside direct, but when they are assigned as the team leader, so they are your coordinating team. Uh, who else we have here? We have our shift, su shift supervisors. They are our, for example, in our hospital, we call them shift supervisor. They, they are our co coordinating team. They help coordinate the care and the work. They don't have a direct contact with the patient, but they're there to help and support. Another group is the ancillary and the support services. So uh, we have other people who, do, these two groups, some of them have a direct, yes, they have a direct contact with the patient, for example, subspecialty. You, you request a consultation from surgery, metabolic, hematology. They come, they provide, they come and examine the patient, provi uh, provide uh, their feedback or 
ask order for certain blood work or treatment and they leave and that's one group another group is your environmental care it's your uh, your as Ms. Ms. Hamira was mentioning the pharmacy the radiology all these other groups who comes in and goes and they are not there for a long period of time the last group here is our administration so I think it's very clear who are in an administration group they are our top leaders they are the those who design and share the strategies, the vision, the goals, they monitor and they communicate those visions and they monitor the implementation and they give and they are our support because they support us through our performance and they, uh, I, if there's things not going well, they modify the plan. So those, it's good to look at it this way. So when we are in the clinical area, we know who, who, who's representing who and how critical it is for all of us to communicate in a very clear way uh, in order to achieve our goal. Okay, so now we will jump to communication. So we're, we're done with the team structure. A very critical here item is the communication. Okay. Effective communication skills are vital for patient safety. It enables teams members to eff effectively rely information, the mood, the mood by which most team step strategy and tools are executed by communication. So uh, there's the, the, here we have a little bit of history uh, from joint commission, uh, from the AHI, from different um, uh, different uh, agencies and different bodies. And the, in conclusion, communication is a critical and is the top uh, uh, root cause for patient harm and sentinel events within healthcare system. And this is the reason why we're focusing on making sure that our staff can communicate, our team can communicate with each other. It's an effective, not only communicate, it should be an effective communication. Okay, we will look at this slide and maybe the people can help us here. Uh, some of the, the characteristic of effective communication, it should be clear, brief, timely, and complete. So in this poster that we're looking at, and our colleagues, the big win, do you think that those posters are helpful? Do you think the brief is brief? By the time I read all this information, I'm already in the water and I'm eaten. So you, you again, it's the same principles. Raise your hand if you wish to answer the questions or comment on the clarity, brief and timely communication in this illustration. So the first one says brief and it gives a message that our public water is currently closed because it is not open, the management. But by the time you read it, you're already in the water. It's too late. So it's not actually brief. Okay, the same works for the second two posters. I'm not sure if there are any participants, uh, but the second two uh, illustration also the same. One say uh, gives you a different direction. So the fish is looking in different area and the arrows are different area. So it's not actually clear. And the last one is, is it, was, it, was it timely? It says seals in the water do not swim. Unfortunately, the penguin are already in the water, which means it was too late by the time the, the sign was put in place. So what we're trying to say is your communication should be complete, should be brief, should be clear, and should be timely in order for it to be effective. Okay. Below are some of the communication challenges that we deal with in a daily basis. I believe each one of you experienced this. Language barrier, distractions, physical proximity, different personalities, the low workload, huge workload, different communication style, conflicts, lack of information verification, and shift change as one of the, it, it can affect communication because a lot of communication problem and conflict happen during that transition of care, shift to shift. So the, the team step uh, program give us tools. So they go, we go through the, diff the four uh, key principles and in each, uh, in each uh, model, they will give you some tools to help you to uh, improve. 
So for example, for now for communication, there's actually a lot of tools. Uh, I only listed a few of them. So we have SBAR, our friend SBAR, call out, check back, hands off, I pass the button. So we, the time for the, due to the time limit, we will not be able to go through them all, but I love SBAR and we all love SBAR. I think as nurses, I'm not sure uh, if, um, who are our, our audience? Are we all nurses or we have people from other specialty? But I will believe within nursing, we all know SBAR. Uh, and hopefully we're doing well right now. And uh, actually now it's not only SBAR, it's ISBAR. The, the, the first letter is I for identification. So it's a tool that helps you to communicate timely, complete information, timely and brief and clear. Okay, so SBAR provides a framework for team members to effectively communicate information to one another. Communicate the following information. We'll start with the identification where you're identifying yourself as the person giving the information. And if you're reporting uh, information about your patient, you have to also identify your patient. The situation that you are reporting, what is the problem, the background, and the assessment and your recommendation or your request. So are we comfortable in using SBAR? Do you think we're doing well? What do you think, Ms. Maha? So what do you think, guys? How, first, let's ask the first question. How many of you are using SBAR in their day-to-day -day patient care communication? Can you raise hands if you are using SBAR? Okay, we have a couple of people. Okay, almost everyone. So that That's means the tool is known tool. So do you think SPAR give you an opportunity for explaining or communicating a cl clear message to one another as a team? We see some hands. Hopefully they are in agreement. You can Inshallah. continue, Nora. <laughs> okay. Uh, let us, uh, I hope this video will work. It will give us an example of the correct way. This is one of the example of correct way of using SPAR. This is a nurse who's reporting, relaying her patient uh, information and her concern to a physician who's not, who's on call, but not in-house on call. So she's somewhere in her accommodation and the nurse is calling her. Let us listen to it and then we can decide if what we do in a daily basis is the correct way of using SBAR. Ms. Nora, just make sure the volume is high. Okay. Because we can't hear her. No sound. We can't hear her. No sound. Uh, Miss Nora, if you yes. can, uh, if you can, probably. Um, I don't know, the voice is not clear. If you can use the same link as, as a YouTube link and then you share YouTube screen, you might uh, be able uh, to hear it. Okay, I'll try. Because during your PowerPoint, uh, we can't hear it. I don't know uh, why. Okay, I'll try. And we can see the video, but we can't hear the conversation.
Can you hear it now? Uh, no. Really. Still. Yeah. So. Oh, okay. We can we can skip this. Okay, due to this, uh, we will just skip the videos and uh, I'll go try to share again my slides. Is it clear? Yes. Okay. Sorry about this. Usually, uh, we all usually have problem with the... Okay, we'll go back to the SPAR concept. So the concept of SPAR is we, as we mentioned that we believed, okay, we know SPAR, thanks God. From nursing point of view, I'll say 99.9 .9 of us, we know what is SPAR, but are we using it correctly? The idea of this, this video was that the nurse was, sorry, uh, the nurse was, the nurse was able to use the SPAR uh, correctly, where she was prepared, she did her, homework where she reviewed her patient file and history so when she called the doctor she was able to identify herself identify the unit the patient and give a little bit of background about the patient then the assessment so the lab work the current condition the decreased urine output and the color of the unit and then in the end she was able to give some recommendation and some request to the physician this helped the person who's listening to the message to also organize his thoughts. What usually happens is we call a physician, so-and-so, uh, potassium of so-and-so. Yeah, especially if, if, the, if you think about the other person, if he's running with in, uh, covering different units, different patients, different scenarios, maybe he's also overload, maybe he was working for the last 18 hours, he may not make the right decision and give you the right answer if you don't give him the proper SPAR. So what we're trying, this video basically says is that you need, you need to be prepared to give the SPAR. Uh, the fact that we only give the name and the condition and the result is not enough. We need to also support that with your recommendation, especially if you're calling someone in the middle of the night or at home like this person. This physician was able to give uh, a good recommendation. And at the end of the call, she was able to tell the nurse, please call me back if there's any changes. So it was a good example of using uh, the SPAR. I'm sorry about the technical issue. What, we, we, what I can do is I can send you guys the links. So hopefully you can view it in the YouTube. They're all available for free. So that was one our that's what, this is our famous tool, the SPAR. We don't use it only in the clinical area. We even use it in administrative. Now it became part of our emails and our communication. Uh, for me to communicate as, uh, an event, it's easier for me to use the SBAR than to write two pages of story about what happened and how it happened. Uh, so it became even my norm now that I, I try to structure my emails or my messages, uh, even personal now in that way. I don't write SBAR, but uh, within the content, I know it was organized in a SBAR format. Another tool that, uh, that's important is what uh, in team steps, the terminology here is call out. A strategy used to communicate important or critical information. It informs all team members uh, in, within the same time that something is wrong. There is an emergency. It helps the team member to anticipate next step and prepare for it and respond immediately. What do you think is an example of a call out in our system or our hospitals? What do we have in our system that it has a different term, but it's basically the call out? Uh, if you allow me to answer, Ms. Nola. Yes, believe, yes, please. Uh, I believe the timeout procedure before any invasive procedure is a, a form of call out where we basically bring attention of everybody that we are about to start a procedure. Yes. Or, yeah, and if there is something wrong, so you're in the timeout, now you discover something is wrong, so you, you bring everybody's attention that something is wrong, let us not proceed. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Maha. Another example of a call out is your code blue and code red. When you say, when you shout code blue, everybody understands what you're talking about. So it's another form of a call out. Okay, I'll try it. 
Okay. Another, another terminology or another tool provided in under communication for us to use in our daily basis is check back. So check back is a way where while we're communicating, how many times you communicate with someone, but they get it wrong or they get the wrong message or the, you know, uh, you ask a physician for an order, he orders something else for you. So check back is a form of making sure that you close the loop. It's a closed loop communication uh, to make sure that the message you send the person, the other, the receiver received it and it's correct and they confirm that they received it. Uh, examples of this in our daily work is, uh, for example, the read back. We have for, for telephonic and uh, critical orders where the physician has no time to write, we, we, we use the verbal, we use the read back. So this is another way of check back to make sure that the message I receive is correct. Uh, another example of the check back that we use in my unit, uh, and it was implemented after uh, many issues and many uh, errors related to miscommunication, is what we call uh, um, uh, re recall. We recall or we recap. We recap, sorry, recap. So in our unit, uh, I'm from the NRC, as Ms. Maha mentioned, and we had issues where the round is lengthy, a lot of people are discussing, and there's an education. <laughs> And by the time they finish the round on one patient, we all actually forget what we discuss and we forget what was the plan. So what we introduce is uh, a recap. So it's a check, another way of check back. So either the primary nurse in the bedside or one of the residents who's in charge of the patient, we basically summarize what was discussed and what is the order. Basically, what was the order? What's the action plan? What is our plan of care? So it's another way of making sure that we communicate clearly and everybody uh, understand and we did not uh, misinterpret or misunderstand any of what was uh, the things that was discussed. And it's a very effective tool. Okay, so those are a few of the tools that's available for us under communication. There are more, uh, more of more that can be used, uh, but be, because of sake of time, we were gonna only focus on those three. The next uh, key concept of the T steps is leading team uh, or leadership. Leadership. Also, now, now we need some participation. So we have different people and pictures in this slide. Uh, do you believe we have leaders within this poster? Well, I believe Donald Trump wouldn't like my answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. I did not put Biden. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> okay. And, um, so we, do we have any participants in here? Uh, I can see Ms. Ramiz. Ramiz, you yes. can uh, unmute yourself. And we have Asma. So let's, uh, let's ask Ramiz to unmute herself and then we'll give a chance to Ms. Asma. Sure. Good evening, all of you. Good evening. Uh, I am Mr. Mia. Head nurse from Prince Sultan Military Medical City, Riyadh. Ma nice to meet you. Yeah, thank you so much. It's a nice lecture. Thank you. I can see Mahatma Gandhi. He's from India. Excellent. Yes. He's a, he's a good leader. Yes. Uh, and I believe the other one is Nelson Mandela. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Ms. Asma? I can see many uh, leadership, um, many personality, uh, same as uh, uh, the, the Indian person, uh, democratic, and uh, um, the democratic, the Napoleon. Uh, Hitler, we have Hitler, Hitler. here. <laughs> yes, Hitler. <laughs> yani, many uh, um, the leadership. So, um, and uh, that lady, the... Opera, uh, opera, democratic. So uh, there is many, many uh, personality and many uh, leadership. Yeah. And also the the uh, the American one. I don't know what his name. You don't know Trump? 
Uh, I forgot his name. Uh, I know him. He's very famous. <laughs> Trump or <laughs> you mean you mean um, uh, Luther King, Martin Luther Luther King? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So many uh, leadership. Okay. So, um, Miss uh, uh, Nora, if you allow me now to to give my answer. Definitely, definitely. So, definitely. so for for me, uh, leadership is the not all. It's not an the power of managing people. Leadership is the power of empowering people and inspiring people. So I see Martin Luther King in this picture, Oprah Winfrey, and for sure, uh, I agree with the Ramis, Mahatma Gandhi and Nelson Mandela. With all of my respect to politicians, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Me too also. He's the best one. Yes, we can agree and disagree, but each one of them is a leader. Uh, this is the conclusion of this slide because uh, we have we have a designated leader and we have a situational leader, which we're going to discuss soon. And the idea is the ability of those individuals to influence people, to end up with having a group who believes on them and believe on their you know, either charisma, either uh, their goal, because they all have a united or one goal. But each one of those members, either we agree or dis disagree, became a leader in a good or a bad way. Definitely. If you tell me Hitler, I would say he's not how many people that end up dying uh, on that time. But he's one of the leaders in the history. We may disagree, but because of his influence and his, his ability to Unite, unite a group of people under him to fight and go that far. That that made him a leader. Good or bad is something else. We're not we're not going to discuss that. But definitely, we have opera. She has no opera. Who doesn't have any um, no designated role? But yes, she is a leader and she influenced millions of people. Nelson Mandela, Gandhi, Luther King, all of them. And it, we, you can put as many pictures you can. The, the, the bottom line here is, yes, we have two types of uh, leaders. We have the designated and we have the situational. And uh, both are important. And uh, it's important for us to identify those characters. So leadership or le a leader holds a team, uh, teamwork system together. It ensures a plan is conveyed, reviewed, and updated, facilitated through communication, continuous monitoring of the situation and fostering of an environment of mutual support. So for you to say, yeah, we do have a good leader, that leader need to have those characteristics or those uh, quality or this ability of performance in order to lead the team uh, efficiently. As we mentioned type of leaders, you have designated and you have situational. We have the person assigned to lead and organize a team, establish clear goals, facilitate open communication and team among team members. And we have the situational. And uh, any team members who has the skill to manage the situation at hand can be a leader. Another, another participation here. Do we, who, who, who's important, designated or the situational? And do we need more designated or we need more situational leaders? So the question is, which is more important, designated leader or situational leader? And those who would like to answer, raise your hand, please. So Ms. Fatima, you can unmute yourself. Okay, uh, good evening. Uh, I believe both are very important, uh, but situational leaders are more needed, especially if we want uh, to maintain patient uh, safety among uh, frontline staff. But to have those type of people who will uh, run the uh, work as leaders, they need good designated uh, uh, leaders to give them the support and to empower them. So, they depend on them. We cannot have situational leaders if we don't have designated leaders. Uh, thank uh, you, Ms. Fatim. We, we do have another two hands, Ms. Yes, Samira please. and Ms. Lija, or Mr. Lija. I don't know if Mr. or Mr. So you can unmute yourself. 
and give your answer, please. Uh, for me, uh, the same uh, answer with Fatma. Both of them are important. Uh, we can't have a situational leader if we don't have designated one. And vice versa, we don't have, we can't have situational leader if we, have, if we don't have uh, a good designated one. Okay. Last one, if you allow me, Ms. Intisar. Unmute yourself. Uh, hello. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I think these two is uh, both important, but uh, designated, they have uh, already a uh, plan of rules like that to stand there yani for their what yani, for their subordinates. Well, situational, yani, we we don't know any time we will face any yani, situation that we need a leader. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you for all the participation. Actually, you summarize it. Um, yes, both of them are important. As Mr. Fat Ms. Ms. Fatima sorry, said, uh, without designated leaders, we will um, our effective designated leader will not be able to operate. Yes, they 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 put the strategy, they put the plan, they put the goal goals, they train their team members, and they empower them. And therefore, you will be able to have a strong situational team leader, each member. Yes, uh, let us be practical. Not every team member will become a leader. But to have a good number of, uh, of your team who are empowered and prepared to, to you know, step up when, when the situation needs. So if you have a code and your charge nurse is not available, she's on break or she, she's transferring a patient or whatever, you need someone who can st you know, step up and take that role. So this is the situational. And to say the truth, our hospitals function this way. We function with situational leaders. This is the reality. Our designated leaders are available, but they, are, they, don't, they don't work 24 seven, right? Based on what they trained us and the policy and procedure and guide and whatever they put in place, our situational leaders are the one running the team. We have designated like the team leader, the shift supervisor, but then we have many, many other situational leaders within our unit which we should uh, appreciate and recognize and empower them more in order to maintain this excellent work. Okay, so uh, who's an effective leader or effective team leader? Uh, so now we're talking about both. We're not talking about designated or situational. Any team leaders can be the situational or the designated. Someone who organized the team, someone who articulate a clear goal. Uh, make decisions through collective input of members, empower members to speak up and challenge when appropriate, actively promote and facilitate good, good teamwork, are skillful in uh, conflict resolution. Team leaders are involved in planning, so they initiate the plan and the, and the processes. Uh, team members are included, so they make sure that they don't plan in their offices and then give the orders to the rest of the team. They involve their team members in the planning uh, phase and they empower the team members uh, with making sure that everybody understands the plan uh, and the problem and the reason why we're going in this direction and how to respond to any issues that they encountered through the journey. Uh, leaders promote uh, by promote uh, the leadership is promoting and modeling teamwork. So effective leaders cultivate desired team behavior. So they walk the talk. So they openly share information. Uh, we know, we all know information is a power, and and sometimes we struggle where certain individual, certain leader, and a boss, uh, uh, they keep information for themselves, and this does not help the rest of the team. So, being an effective leader, you need to openly share information, uh, role modeling, and effective uh, queuing of team members to you to 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 use prescribed teamwork behavior and skills, constructive and timely feedback, and facilitation of briefs, huddle debrief and conflict resolution. So under leadership, those are the tools the team steps is giving us. Uh, within team, uh, within leadership, tools to help you to, to lead and to improve communication, decision-making and changing of the plan are those tools, which is debrief, huddle and debrief. 
and the conflict resolution skills or tools given to us here. So I think those are, uh, we also, from nursing point of view, I believe we hear a lot about this and hopefully we're practicing it. So briefs is in the planning phase. So before an event, before a change, before a new, new implement, implementation of a new project, we need briefs. Uh, we do, so in some places we brief, for example, every morning. Every morning we have a gathering, guys, this is our day. We have X number of patients, we have X number of procedures. Unfortunately, we're short staff, therefore sometimes we double patient. We're expecting a uh, transfer from another hospital. You know, there is a, we have that brief at the beginning of the shift where every team members is involved and he knows what's going on. Uh, I'm not sure in, uh, in, uh, in all the units, but it to, to, for this brief to be effective, it should be multidisciplinary also. I think all brief, huddle or debriefs, it should be multidisciplinary. Unfortunately, sometimes we do our own brief nursing. We have our own brief, but we re we, it's, very, it's very rare that we have physicians or RTs or other specialty joining us in those briefs. Uh, the next tool is the huddles. Huddles is a quick meeting, a small meeting, anytime within the day, uh, to address an issue. So something happened. So either a change in the patient condition uh, and, and uh, influx that we're we have to rearrange our team. So something happened. So anytime, 1 p.m., 1 a.m., I will call for a quick huddle. I will call everybody who's involved. I will call my me medical, nursing, RT. If I need my shift supervisor, I will involve her and say, this is what's going on, guys. We need, we need to rearrange. We need to open extra beds. We need to transfer patient out, whatever we need to do to manage that situation. Uh, a debrief is after event. It's usually uh, after an event, either good or bad, positive or negative. Uh, and the aim of this debrief is to for process improvement. Yes, the main aim is to, for process improvement, but also it's good to help with appreciation, with uh, helping your team to ventilate and share their feelings and how the situation went. We're very good, I think, with debriefing, especially after a code. So whenever we have a code blue, I know we, it's a mandatory that we have a debrief and nursing team is usually the one running and actually making sure that the debriefs are uh, done and conducted. But then this is debrief, conducting a debrief is a skill. Um, I, I, I joined, I, I was in debriefs where things went really bad, where we only talked about negative things, what went wrong and who did what, and instead of concluding in a positive uh, you know, feeling that, okay, we did well, no matter what is the outcome of the patient, we did our best. Here are the area for improvement that we're gonna carry out and we will try to improve in. Everybody left that meeting with a heavy heart, with the guilt, you know, and shame. So it's very critical for debrief or who's running the debrief or facilitating the debrief that the focus is process improvement uh, helping their team members to to uh, ventilate and speak and not to uh, pinpoint or blame anybody during that activity. If there is a performance related issue that can be done one on one with the individual after the debriefing, but it should not happen during the debriefing session itself. So leaders are responsible to assemble the team and facilitate team events. But remember, anyone can request a brief huddle or debrief. This is very critical for us because we believe those, those meetings can be only done by the chargers, only by the nurse manager. No, anybody with the team, a situational leader who feels there's something wrong can call for such an, uh, uh, a meeting. I will give you an example since our videos are not working. Uh, I will give you an example about the huddle. In our unit, we're an ICU unit, and we had our multidisciplinary meeting, and there was a decision by the consultant that we will extubate three patients after the round, and we had two dressing change, central line dressing change. Usually, central line dressing change is done by, by a physician in our unit. So all this activity was supposed to be done immediately after the round. After the round, usually people disappear. Our physicians disappear either for break, uh, for, uh, extra activities, or, uh, or maybe their boss call or whatever. So luckily, one of the team members noticed that something is wrong here. This will not end up good. If we extubate three patients and they need to be reintubated, 
and we have no physicians available in the clinical area because they're involved also in dressing changing. So what she did is she called for a huddle. She was able to notify me. She was we were able to she was able to talk to the consultant. He called his team back and he rearranged the plan. So the extubation sessions were timed. So we have a, like two hours, two are planned for after the round and one after 4 p.m. by the night team. And the dressing change also was rescheduled. So th this was a positive outcome from that huddle. And, and someone was able to speak up and recognize that something is wrong here. That, so anybody can do it. It doesn't need to be your charge nurse. It can be anybody who feels that something is wrong here. So sharing the uh, so briefs is about sharing a plan. So as we mentioned, it's before an event or a beginning of the shift or planning for something new that's going to happen. A team briefing is an effective strategy for sharing the plan. From the uh, briefs should help uh, form the team, dis uh, designate team roles and responsibility, establish a climate and goals, engage team in a short and long term planning. Uh, huddles uh, uh, huddles is a result of monitoring and modifying the plan. So because you keep monitoring what's going on, you decide something is wrong here. So, and from there you need to modify your plan. So you call for a huddle. So it can be ad hoc uh, meeting with the team. It doesn't need to be the whole team. It can be only a few member of the team who's directly involved in the situation, discuss critical issues and emerging events, anticipate outcomes and likely contingencies and assign resources and express concerns. We'll skip the video. Uh, reviewing team performance. Okay, debriefing is after an event. And the purpose of the team briefing, as we mentioned, is the uh, reviewing the performance and uh, making recommendation for the future. Uh, brief uh, informal information exchange and feedback session occur after an event or a shift uh, designed to improve teamwork skill, designed to improve outcomes. Uh, Accurate recounting of key events. So when, when you have the debriefing immediately after the event, it's easy for people to remember. It's not like when you call for a debriefing after a week of an event, for example. It's, it will be hard for the people. So ideally, it should happen immediately after the event. Uh, analysis of why the event occurred, discussion of lessons learned, and reinforcement of the success, and re uh, revising the plan for the future. Another critical role of the leader is conflict resolution. Uh, effective leaders facilitate conflict resolution to avoid compromising patient safety and quality of care, do not allow interpersonal or irrelevant issues to, ne uh, to negatively affect the team, help team members master conflict resolution technique. And uh, I can sadly say that this is one of the area where, where we need a lot of improvement and a lot of practice uh, and a lot of enhancement because we avoid conflict. Uh, or we avoid conflict resolution, even if we are sometimes the leaders, uh, because it's difficult and it's not. Uh, it's hard to. Uh, it's hard to achieve the win-win. Uh, so we don't manage it well, unfortunately. I don't know about Miss Maha. Well, it's. Uh, I believe it's conflict resolution is tricky for. Uh, couple of things. One of them is situational awareness. Are we aware about the, the whole situation in order to make sound judgment and clear that conflict and resolve it? Number two, are we acknowledging our limitation and accepting tr critique? Or we became more defensive when we found ourselves in, um, in a conflict situation? Number three, and I think it's very important, are we as a team uh, willing to be accountable and most importantly, willing to basically learn from that and leverage on it as a new experience and move forward? Thank you, Ms. Maha. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it is, it is, it's, it is enough. For me, as uh, I would say an old nurse or an old team leader, uh, it's one of the area that I have difficulty empowering my team to get to this level. Unfortunately, what my conclusion is we protect the relationship. And uh, for the sake of the relationship, we undermine the system, we undermine the patient safety. 
uh, I don't want to say, I don't want to sound negative, but unfortunately, this is what we see frequently, that a lot of situation that can be managed well, unfortunately goes bad because we try to avoid that personality, that uh, personal uh, relationship. And uh, it's, it's related to maturity, accountability, as you mentioned. Hopefully we can, we can improve in this, inshallah. Okay, you, and Ms. Maha mentioned the situational awareness of situational monitoring. So this is the next step of our team steps uh, program. Leadership and communication is something we heard a lot about, but I think not all of us here heard about situational monitoring is, and situational awareness. So if you look at this picture, what do you think is going on? Do you think we have situational monitoring here or awareness? Not really. Yes. The boar penguin is running after the fish and he thinks this is his lunch, but he does not realize that he is the lunch. This guy is pulling him to the water in order to eat him. So this is what it's like a summary of what situational monitoring is. Okay. Uh, uh, if you allow me to comment. Yes, yes, Ms. Mahat. If you can go but, back to the same illustration. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm just going to share advice, not because I'm a, a wisdom person, but because <laughs> one, of the, one of the wisdom advice that I received uh, earlier on from one of the very senior uh, leader, who is, uh, I'm lucky to be her mentor, she told me, uh, when you come in a position to manage people and manage situation, you have to think about the bigger picture instead of individual interest to the group interest, number one. Number two, you need to be smart to learn how to swim with the shark. So I think this poor penguin is not smart to learn how to swim with the shark. Obviously, this guy is, has a shark attitude. <laughs> Yeah, he's only focusing on the boar fish in front of him. He cannot see the bigger picture. Thank you, Ms. Mahal. Okay, situational monitoring. So situational monitoring is an individual skill. It's a skill that each one of us should develop and work on developing. So it's a process of actively scanning behaviors and action to assess elements of the situation or the environment. We don't work alone. We work in an environment with many other individuals, different subspecialty, um, a lot of things going on at the same times. So the ability to monitor what's going around in your environment is very critical. It, it fosters mutual respect and team accountability. It provides safety net for team and, resi and resident. Resident here is the patient, they mean the patient, and includes cross-monitoring. Remember, engage the patient whenever possible. Situational monitoring ensures new or changing information is identified immediately in any timely manner and communicated to help with decision making and changing the plan. Leads to effective support of fellow team members. Okay, so do, okay, we'll go to the next one, then we will have some discussion. Cross monitoring. So we'll start with situational monitoring where you're looking around you generally what's going on how many procedures are going on, how many families are around, uh, is there a uh, a code going on, are we short staff, you know, you're looking globally around you what's going on. Then cross monitoring. Cross monitoring is another individual skills that we as individuals should develop. It's the process of monitoring the action of other team members for the purpose of sharing the workload and reducing or avoiding errors. Mechanism to help maintain accurate situational awareness, way of watching each other back, ability of team members to monitor each other task ex execution and give feedback during task, task, uh, task execution. So cross monitoring is very critical and it's very important, but I think we view it, again, I'm not being negative, but a lot of us in the bedside nurses, we see things going wrong. We see wrong procedures, wrong implementation, um, things not, we're not following a policy, for example, but we keep quiet. So this is the cross monitoring. You're not cross. You're not cr doing the cross monitoring or practicing it because you wanna 
be the spy. You don't want to be the one with the highest number of safety reports. Not because you want to put someone in trouble. It's the opposite. It's to watch each other back and support each other. And in the end of the day, support the patient and the unit and the environment. Mutual performance monitoring has been shown to be an important team competency. So you, can, you cannot say we're an effective team or an excellent team or a dream team if we do not support each other. So you, you, while you're doing your cross monitoring, you notice a nurse is not performing a proper heart hygiene. You don't say, okay, oh my God, she's my senior staff. I, I will not even dare to correct her. No, you will go there and remind her in a pro very professional way. Maybe she's overloaded. She, so she missed a step or a critical step. You're not doing it to be mean or to put her down or to report her. You're doing it for the safety of the patient and her, and her safety also. Okay. If we practice situational monitoring and cross uh, monitoring, we will end up with what we call situational awareness. So what is situational awareness? It's a state of knowing the current condition affecting the team or so because you have the ability of monitoring and, and 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 being able to see what's going around you and out of that you you concluded you made a conclusion this is your the awareness you made a conclusion that there's something unsafe going on that need to be corrected or need to be addressed or someone i need to speak to or something that need to be escalated that's a conclusion that you came up after practicing the monitoring and um, yeah, and the cross monitoring so it's knowing the status of the particular particular event, knowing the status of the team uh, of the patient, the team resident, they refer here to the patient, understanding the operational issues affecting the team, maintaining mindfulness. So you're fully aware, for example, if this poor Bingwing was actually practicing all of this, he will know that I'm, I'm the lunch or I'm the dinner because he was able to assist the whole situation and know that, yeah, this is a bet. This is not a real fish sitting here for him to eat. So what are the conditions that can undermine the situational awareness? So failure to share information will lead to failure in situational awareness. So if you, if you practice situational monitoring, cross monitoring, you know what's going around, but you kept the information to yourself. It, it's not gonna help your team and it's not gonna help the patient. Uh, failure to request information from others. So you're not sure. I'm not sure about the plan. I did not get it during the round uh, or the handover from the brief from the, from the other unit or from the previous shift was not clear, but I keep quiet and try to manage without it. That's not gonna help because you don't have a full understanding of what's going on. Failure, failure to direct information to specific team members. You're intimidated by some of your team members. So therefore, either a physician, a nurse, your team leader, or even one of the senior staff. And therefore, you stop the communication there. And that will affect your patient and your unit. Uh, failure to include your patient and their family. And this is very critical. Sometimes the family or the sitter or the patient himself have information that can help you to manage. Uh, maybe something that locks your, uh, your SPAR was not complete that you received from the other unit or your other staff. And the patient actually have the information, but because we do not include them in the round, we do not include them in the handover, therefore we miss this information. Failure to use resource, uh, resources fully. So um, our, our electronic uh, medical record or the chart or the handover tools or the reports that we have, if we don't use it fully, again, we will not reach a pro a, a, an effective situational awareness or a complete situational awareness and failure to document, which is a very common, unfortunately, problem that we, we, we struggle in the healthcare, lack of documentation. Okay, so within this model of situational monitoring, we are given some tools to help us to perform the situational monitoring, to gain the situational awareness. One of those tools is STEEP. STEEP. So STEEP stands for status of the patient, team members, status of the team members, the environment, and progress towards well, uh, the goal. So you need to assess each one of this. This will help you. So if you say, okay, how should I perform my monitoring or situational monitoring? Try. To, this is one tool that you can use. So about the patient, 
you need to know about the history. So patient history, his vital signs, medication, physical exam, plan of care, psychological, uh, you know, everything related to your patient. So you want to make sure that you receive a proper handover, you read your notes, you read the patient charts, uh, you make sure that you have the full story in order for you to manage and serve this patient correctly. Team members. How do you do your monitoring for your team members and people working with you? You want to you want to you want to be able to identify the following: the fatigue. So someone who was in duty for the last five shifts, uh, night duty, three overtime or two overtime. So most probably this person is tired. You need to uh, consider the assignment or the workload that you're going to give to him, or her. the workload, the task performance. So how this person is performing his task. Uh, and the skill level and the stress level. So this is how you monitor your colleagues for, for a good reason, definitely, not to report them, to help them and offer help and support. How do you evaluate or you monitor your environment? So you want to you make sure that you have enough information, facility-related information, your policy, your procedure, your DBP, your ABP, uh, uh, your equipment, your supplies, uh, your disaster plan, contingency plan for the downtime, and all the environment-related information that helps you to manage when things go wrong. And very critical point is the plan, your patient plan. So what is the status of the patient? The goal, so what is the plan? Unfortunately, sometimes we don't have a, a multidisciplinary plan. We have fragmented plan. Uh, subspecialty has their own plan. The primary team has their own plan. The nurse has their own plan of care. So making sure that we have a clear goal and direction where this patient is heading towards. What is the uh, length of stay? What is the discharge date, the expected discharge date? Uh, any additional equipment or things that needed to be ordered, training and teaching, home health, referral, things like that. Okay, again, another activity. Are we on the same page? We, are, we have three different people looking at one picture. So do you think they're all on the same page? Obviously not. Yeah, obviously not. They're looking at, yes, they're all looking at this truck, but they're looking at different parts of the truck. We have the lady who's looking at the driver. We have the, the guy in the middle looking at the truck. We have the other guy on the other side looking at those containers. So if you ask them, they will talk to you about different things. But basically, they were looking at the same thing. And they maybe all sh shake their head if you ask them, ah, do, uh, do we agree on what we're doing? They may all shake their heads. But within their mind, they're doing something different. So this is the importance of communication. So you cannot achieve situational awareness unless we communicate uh, our, uh, what exactly do we understand or what we conclude from the, what, what we saw and what we see, what we heard. So a shared mental model is a perception. Uh, yes, Ms. Father. Nora, uh, I think there's a question. Uh, Shekhat okay. or Sakina, Fadlai, unmute yourself. Uh, actually, I just want to, to share something that each one of us is, um, we are a unique, okay, of our uh, uh, perceiving things or uh, how to think about things that uh, we will see. Each one of us have uh, a different point of view or a different way to see things. Only I just, I want to share this one. Thank you very much. It's very valuable and I totally agree with you. Um... And that's why, the com because we're different and we experience different things, you may come to work and you have a sick child at home, and that's what's actually working on your brain, or you had a conflict with your partner, or you have an exam coming, or the previous shift before you went off, you had an, um, you have an event where something wrong and there was an error in medication, and you're feeling shy and you think everybody's looking at you at the world. So all those things that goes in our brain do affect how we do inter look at things and interpret situations. And But we can overcome this by communicating. The minute we sit together and we communicate, we can clarify all those things. Are we only looking at the truck? What is the focus here? Is it the driver? Is it the truck? Or are the containers in the truck? So when we communicate, then we will end up coming to a conclusion. What exactly is the goal or the problem that we're discussing? And instead of each of us assuming something, and then we all think, okay, we'll all assume that we understood the problem. But basically, no, because we're all in different uh, place or a different page. Thank you very much.
so going back to the shared mental model. So um, at the end of all this activity, if we master it, if you master our situational monitoring, cross monitoring, using the different tools that help us to assess our environment, our patient, our colleague, our uh, environment, then we will end up with a shared mental model and communicate. So it's not only that we, we conclude it in our mind, but now we share it and we communicate it when it's needed, then we will have a shared mental model. Uh, the perception of understanding uh, of or knowledge about a situation or a process that is shared among a team members through communication. So all of this, and I will, I'll, I'll tell you 100%, majority of our nurses, I will, I'll talk about nurse because I'm a nurse. And I hope, I'm not sure if majority of our attendants are nursing also. We know what's going on. We know what's wrong. We know what went wrong, what, 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 what the deviation came from or what resulted but we do not share it. We keep it to ourselves or we doubt maybe is this correct? Is this right? Am I right? Can I, can I speak about it? Should I escalate? We always have this going on in our brain and sometimes we're intimidated. Uh, and so we, it stops there in our mind without co actually communicating it. Okay, how to share mental, uh, how, to sh uh, how shared mental model help teams. So if we have a shared mental models and we communicate it correctly, it helps us to ensure that the teams knows what to expect. Uh, so if, necess uh, if necessary, can regroup and get change the plan or modify the plan, foster communication to ensure care is synchronized, ensure that everyone on the team has a picture of what, is, what, what, uh, what it should look like, enable team members to predict and anticipate better, create commonality, of effort and purpose. Okay, so now we are in the mutual support. So those two guys have a mutual support. They're supporting each other. He's pushing him in order to look at the other side of that uh, wall or ice wall. So mutual support dependent upon information gathering through situational monitoring. You cannot reach a mutual, mutual support. You cannot say my team has a mutual support if you don't master the situational monitoring and situational awareness. Uh, moderated by the communication of information. So you need to communicate. Enhanced by leaders who encourage and role model mutual support. So you, you need communication, you need leadership, and you need situational monitoring and awareness in order to achieve mutual support. So mutual support involves members ass assisting each other, supporting each other, providing and receiving feedback, ex uh, exerting assertive and advocacy behavior when patient safety is threatened. So some of the tools given to us by the team steps in order to achieve uh, the mutual support is task assistance, supporting each other, helping each other during tasks and, and procedures. So team members foster a climate in which it is expected that assistance will be actively sought and offered as method for reducing the occurrence of error. Some of our nurses believe that I'm a super nurse. I cannot ask for help. It's bad to ask for help. I will be thought about like weak, unskillful, unknowledgeable, therefore I will not ask for help. Unfortunately, we, we have some of our members like this. And, uh, and when help is requested, we have two, two group of nurses. We have the group who jumps into the help uh, openly, and I, I will end up doing everything when the primary nurse is uh, busy documenting and I'm done with the admission, I'm done with everything else. And you have another group uh, that, uh, I'm not sure if you know this term that I heard lately, which is facing the wall. The group who's facing the wall are avoiding to help anybody. So they pretend they're busy with their computer, busy with the patient, with the, busy with the alarm, uh, just to avoid helping people. So to say that we are in a good team and we have a mutual support, it should be comfortable for anybody to ask for help. And people should be able to offer help in the correct way. So you can set limits. So you can say, okay, I can come and help you with your admission for the next 30 minutes because my patient is not here. He's in OR. I'm expecting him to be back in 30 minutes. So during this 30 minutes, I'm available for you to help you with the admission and the procedures and everything. So you made it very clear that I'm here only for 30 minutes to avoid any conflict that can rise or misunderstanding. And don't view the need for help as a weakness. 
actually the weakness is when you do not ask for help, which means you did not recognize the load, you did not recognize the criticality of the situation, and you limit as a human, because at the end of the day, we're human, we're humans, and we have limitation. I mean, the workload is uh, not manageable, you're basically harming your patient. Uh, another tool here is the feedback, the ability to give feedback. Feedback is information provided for the purpose of improving team performance. It's not to put you down, it's not to report you, it's not to highlight your weaknesses and how un 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 uh, unknowledgeable you are. It's no, the purpose is to help you. Hopefully that is the intention. The purpose is to give you feedback to improve and to support you in order for you to become a strong team me member who's gonna help me tomorrow when I'm in that situation when I, where I need help. Characteristic of effective feedback, uh, it should be timely. It should be respectful, specific, directed toward improvement, not to bring the do person down. It's not personal. It's not, this is how, who you are. This is how you do every things every time. Uh, it's not personal. It's about the task itself or the knowledge that need to be improved helps prevent the same problem from occurring in the future and is considerate. And this is very critical for our uh, situational leader and our charge nurses because they usually see this a lot. Uh, they see a lot going on in the clinical area. So they need to develop the, the they need to develop the, the ability to give effective feedback in a, in a respectful way, in a timely way for purpose of improvement. And not to leave it for the nurse manager, because what happened is the, the, this is escalated to the nurse manager, but actual staff themselves sometimes don't, did not receive any feedback. So she doesn't know that she did something wrong. She will be called in the nurse manager office the following day because she did this and that. When an ideal situation is where her colleague or her charge or one of her Syrian team member will actually highlight this to her and tell her, you know what, maybe you need to do it differently. Okay, another tool provided for us uh, by Team Steps is the two challenge rule. This is a very critical uh, tool, I, I believe, if we practice it well and pra uh, practice it correctly. How many times you gave feedback to a, a, a colleague or a physician or subspecialty and they did not give you any answer. So you are reporting a result and you don't get an uh, action plan. Uh, so in that case, this is where you use the two challenge rule. We're, so you in the first picture, you gave a message, you gave a result, you gave information, but the person actually did not even acknowledge it. You know, there is no even eye contact as if he did not hear it at all. So it is your responsibility to make sure that you repeat your message again the second time and make sure that you are heard. We're not saying shout, please do not shout but you wanna make sure that your message is heard. There should be an acknowledgement because if there is no acknowledgement, you cannot, that person is not even accountable. He may say the environment was noisy. I was busy thinking about the heart, the ECG of the patient because actually they did not acknowledge even that they heard the message. So this is the two challenge role. Either is a matter of uh, I'm, I'm busy. I did not connect the dots or I was trying to and actually avoid making a decision. We have those situations where you escalate to a physician or you escalate to a charge and you don't get an action back. So you want to make sure that your message is heard the second time. If it's still you don't get an answer, the appropriate answer you expect based on your patient condition, then that's the time you have to escalate. So invoked when an initial assertion is ignored. It is your responsibility to, to assertively voice your concern at least two times to ensure that it has been heard. The member being challenged must acknowledge. If the outcome is still not acceptable, take a stronger course of action, use supervisor or chain of command. I will share an experience with us in our unit where uh, a patient was admitted, uh, a new delivery, where we work in NICU. So our babies come from the labor and delivery. A, a lady delivered, the baby's not doing well. We were called, we brought the baby in. What happened is when we attended this delivery, the person who attended the delivery immediately noticed that there is a malformation, there is a congenital abnormality, the baby's jaw is very small, which is an indication of difficulty of intubation. They will most probably they will not be able to intubate this baby if he needs to be intubated. The baby was not doing well. Uh, they tried to intubate once. It was a very senior medical staff. After one trial, he decided I will stop because I know this is difficult. I will send the baby with the laryngal mask to the unit and we will, act, uh, we will manage it from there. 
So now the baby was brought to the unit and handed over to the different team. So we have a team who handled the patient in the LND, another team in the unit. The team in the unit who received the patient, uh, was there was no proper handover. So there was no proper communication of exactly what happened. They know that this baby came to the unit after one trial of intubation. He's on a ringal mask. Uh, I think no one indicated the proper the, the, the differential diagnosis or expected diagnosis. Anyway, the ENT team and the anesthesia team was activated. Difficult airway team was activated. And the first team who arrived was the ENT team. The ENT team arrived, they looked at the patient, assessed and decided this is an uh, emergency C-section, uh, sorry, emergency OR. We're taking the patient, we're gonna go and prepare and in 30 minutes, the patient should be in OR. So we try, so that was the plan. During that time, while waiting for the OR team to call, the anesthesia team arrived because they are part of the difficult airway uh, team. Now when the team came, they started the trials of intubation. And unfortunately, again, there is no proper communication or I'm not sure what, what going on with the decision making. They decided, although there is a plan for OR, they decided we will try to intubate. And they tried intubating that child several times until he ended up coding. During that activity, one of the nurses who was close to the patient mentioned to us. So we have, and again, remember we talked about the different teams. We have the core team, which is the neonatal team. And we have uh, a contingency team, which is the anesthesia and the ENT and everybody else who's coming to do something there. Now, the primary nurse informed one of our core team, core team physician, a senior physician, that they tried to intubate five times. She did not get the answer. She did not continue with the muscle. She stopped there. Unfortunately, they continued tr the trials until the baby coded, developed emphysema, ended up with a trach performed in the unit, coded several times until we lost the patient. So imagine if this nurse was strong enough to practice the two challenge role. So she knows that we should not do more than three to four trials by one member of the team as per our policy. She mentioned it to one of our senior staff who did not respond. She should repeat her message again in a stronger uh, voice that this patient, was, there, there was five trials. And if still no response, she should come and call her charge, inform her uh, and uh, call the MRB who's in charge of the floor. So escalate, start the process of escalation. Unfortunately, this was, I'm not saying this is the, was the only reason, but it was one of the area of improvement after that uh, difficult situation that we encounter. Yes, Ms. Fatma, Ms. Fatma is raising her hand. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Nora. While you are sharing with us uh, this scenario, I remember the, the castle, which I believe it fits very well uh, this uh, situation. The C for uh, I'm concerned, uh, and uh, the nurse has to verbalize why she is concerned. And if the physician did not hear her or maybe totally uh, ignored her, she moves to a next level of. Uh, uh, using another word like I'm not comfortable and she states the reason why she is not comfortable and if that continues uh, she moves to but this is a patient safety uh, issue which is stronger than uh, the previous uh, uh, words that she used so this uh, language can be used in a critical situation to catch the attention uh, to highlight the criticality of that situation I, personally uh, I love this tool I've been using it a lot, and in such situations, uh, it does work. I just thank wanted you. to share this with you. Thank, thank you very much, Fatma. And actually, this is the next tool that we're going to discuss. <laughs> so you jump to the next uh, slide, actually. So just to continue with the two challenge rule is to empower any team members to stop the line if, if he or she see, uh, sins or discover a breach of safety. This is an action never, be, uh, never to be taken lightly, but it requires immediate cessation of the process and resolution of the safety issue. As nurses, we are powerful. We don't know how powerful we are. There's a lot of activity that cannot proceed without you. 
a central line insertion. Uh, intub intubation is an emergency. I'm not going to stop an intubation, but I need to speak up like in that scenario that something is wrong and something different needs to be done. But we can stop the line. A lot of, a lot of our nurses in OR stop the line and save the patients uh, because there is a missing sponge and the, and the surgeon insists on closing. And the nurse insists, no, we're not going to close because... I believe we are missing a sponge. So there are a lot of situations where we can be very powerful, still professional. We're not saying start a fight, shout, or be disrespectful. With all your professionalism, you can still stop the line and make it very clear, as Ms. Ms. Fatma said, use the tools that's available for us and immediately escalate. Yeah, I will not get into the fight. If after the two challenge uh, statement or assertiveness that a statement I use is still I'm not getting the right answer, I should escalate. I'm not going to go into fight, but I will escalate. So this is the tool Ms. Fatma is talking about. And is yes, it is a very beautiful tool, but it should not be used in a daily basis. You need to use it in critical situations, as Ms. Fatma said, which is cuss, is the cuss word. So I'm concerned, I'm uncomfortable. This is a safety issue. You can use them together when the time is really critical, or you can use them separately with a five minutes, uh, you know, gap uh, to make sure that your message went through and something is being done. The minute you say this is a safety issue, this is the time when you're stopping the line and you expect this, the, the person receiving the message to stop. But uh, Ms. Fatma, if the rest of the team is not trained on what this cost means, then they will not take it uh, critically. So that, uh, it's important that when we're using those tools, the rest of the team is also trained and they're aware what we mean by CUS. So for nurses, please use this, it's very beautiful. But before we start using it, we're gonna make sure that maybe we share the poster first. It's, it's very simple. If you go to Google, you can Google CUS and then you can print it in a bigger size start the awareness and share it with everybody. What do we mean on when are we going to use it? And therefore you can start using it and you expect a response from the other person. Yeah, this is a video, but unfortunately we cannot play it. Another tool to help us with, uh, sorry, uh, for conflict resolution uh, is what we call disk, disk script. And actually now it has, it's like a, a verb now, disk it, let us disk it. It's a constructive approach for managing and resolving conflict. As we mentioned, conflict is not an easy thing to manage. It's not an easy thing to, it's one of the area that we usually have issues with. So when there is a conflict, and uh, I, it's good to maybe follow those steps in order for you to address it. So try to take the person aside in a private area, maintain professionalism, maintain respect, and describe the specific situation that you have an issue with express your concern about the action, uh, try to suggest other alternative, and it's good to put consequences uh, clearly. Here, we're not trying to threaten anybody, but it's, it's important to understand that if things continue the way it is with no resolution, then there's another step that can be taken. Um, one, one, one important thing here, usually when we're, do, when we're managing the conflict is when you're expressing your concern, Avoid the you and focus on the I. When you say you did, you said, usually the other person become very defensive and they stop listening and they start only looking for answers and looking for ways to defend themselves and to rationalize their action. But if you focus on saying me, I was disappointed. I, f I was embarrassed. Uh, I felt bad. It, it gives a room to the other person to actually try to think and reflect. And usually, usually the response is usually much better. So this is a, actually a very good tool that we can use with conflict management. So for the sake of time, I think we will, we will, I, will I will stop here. So to give a time for our team to, for questions and discussions. This is the summary of all the tools uh, given to us by the team step. Team step. So we cover communication. We have different tools like SPAR, call out, check back, handoffs. Under leading and leadership, we have brief, huddle and debrief. Under situational monitoring, we have the steep. Uh, I'm safe, I'm, I did not cover the I'm safe. I can cover it quickly now. And the cross monitoring, mutual support, which is task assistant, feedback, two challenge to, uh, role, CUS, Disk it or disk script and Aline. Aline is another tool that you can use for conflict, but conflict usually with the patient and their family. 
usually if if you know you you, you anticipate in advance that there will be a problem with this family so this is an, a tool that you can use to manage that situation so team step outcomes you expect collaborative te uh, teams shared mental model adaptability team orientation mutual trust team performance and advocacy for patient safety and also advocacy for your colleagues and uh, team members in the uh, so, so far, this is what we covered, uh, the, the actual concept and the strategy and the tools uh, provided for us to manage. Uh, they are all available to both the team members and the leaders. Uh, team step is um, addresses the barriers to the team effectiveness in a given situation can be applied in any any situation, anything that you can think about in, in a, if it is a home health care, if it is a rural, you know, uh, clinics, if it is in the critical care, in you know, OR, you can apply it in any situation and it will help the team to function well. So thank you very much and uh, time for questions or discussions. Thank you so much, Ms. Nora. Uh, I really enjoyed the session. And I personally think that one of our uh, bigger contributors to conflict, to delay taking action, to delay taking decision, to probably taking serious things lightly or the opposite, exaggerating things that can be solved easily, is the way we communicate. And linking communication to a quality tool will basically help all disciplines nurses, physician, patients and family to come up with the best care we could give. So I'm gonna leave the questions to the participant. Mashallah, we have more than 200 participants. So please Mashallah. guys, raise your hands if you have a questions or comment, definitely. You can also use the chat box to write your question if you like. Okay, I can't see any hands. Uh, so Ms. Nora, I actually have a question. Totally. Uh, so when you discuss in your uh, slides, about the difference between debrief, huddles, and uh, briefing. Yes. How do you see the unit culture affecting uh, utilization of these tools to address issues and patient care concerns? Let me give an example. So for example, of course, the unit culture in neonatal ICU would be different from general mid-search mid area or OR. So how do you see the culture of the unit affecting uh, the team communication and contributing probably to successful communication or a barrier to communication? Uh, thank you, Ms. Maha. I, I believe it's the way we introduce or the way we apply the tool. Uh, for example, the daily huddle or the morning huddle, it was something that was actually introduced by our uh, teams. And it was like an expectation from every unit to have that morning huddle. And because it was initially put in place like a expectation, you have to do it. I will say many of us didn't know actually what to do. So it was uh, some, some unit will start the, uh, the huddle in the morning, how many patients we have, what assignment, uh, how many patients we have yesterday, or how many L&D calls. Then we gradually said, okay, but this is not helpful. This is not really helping. It's not the purpose of the briefing. We should focus. It should not be the night team who should give the briefing. It should be the day shift team, or at least the, one of the charge nurses from the night plus the day shift to plan. This is what happened. This is what we expect. So give me, give me the expectation. Give me an SPAR for the coming 12 hours or the next eight hours. What's going to happen? Um, some units are using the, hud the morning huddle for education. I cannot blame them because, yeah, if there is something critical that needs to be addressed, it's a good opportunity. But in some area, we do the huddle for the sake of huddle with no proper agenda. So uh, there was a time when I, I, I disliked the idea of the daily. What is the purpose? If I don't have a proper agenda that I'm going to work on it, why should I have a daily huddle? Okay, it's good to have a daily huddle, for example, if you're in OR or day surgery or where, yes, there's something new, there's something different. 
or I will give you a plan. I will give you an idea. For example, we had one day where we had uh, a bland uh, cesarean section for a lady with a quadruplet. So this lady is pregnant with four babies. So it's a C-section, which means every baby will require two nurses, a physician, an ideal and an RT. They will need equipment uh, to be brought to the LND and the transportation and possible maybe resuscitation within LND. So that's a full plan that can be discussed in the morning with the whole team. So not only the assigned nurses and, and the physician, and the RT, but the rest of the team to know that this is how much critical the day will be and the fact that we may need extra staff and uh, to gain the cooperation of everybody. Uh, so that can be either a brief if it is bland ahead of time and we know the information or it can become a huddle. So suddenly in the middle of the day, we heard, okay, we have an emergency C-section. So you call for a huddle and you manage the situation. So it's, and this is about the, uh, the briefing because we do a lot of briefing. We do deep briefing, but unfortunately we do it only for a code. Mm -hmm. Okay. Only, when there's, only when there's a code blue, then there's a debrief. And there are sometimes there is no even debrief after those events if the team leader does not support the idea. So we don't push hard for it. But a debrief can happen after a code, can happen after a difficult uh, scenario in the unit. It can happen after a scenario like we had where we admitted four babies, uh, where half of the unit was busy admitting. And actually... On that scenario, we end up with a fifth baby. The lady had five babies, actually. There was one that was not discovered in the ultrasound. So that was an emergency for us to provide the staff and the equipment and everything. So after that event, it's good to have a debriefing to share what happened, how we managed, say thank you to everybody, appreciate everybody. But we don't, we don't practice that a lot. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about the, the ad hoc huddles. I'm not sure. It happens usually in the leadership level when we expect uh, uh, something big going on and there's a big change. So we usually as managers and team leaders, we are called for an ad hoc to plan and disseminate the information. But within the unit level, I'm not sure if we're doing it frequent, frequently enough. Thank you, Ms. Nora. There is a question or a comment from Mr. Jazzy. Uh, Jazzy, unmute yourself, please. Hey, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Nora, my question, um, I know it's difficult, but just I want to know how you can minimize the effect of the micromanagement. I know you cannot prevent or handle it 100%, but how you can deal with it as a senior managers? Micromanagement. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, it's a tough question. We should, uh, as much we can, uh, we need to, as, as a leader, you're talking about the leader role, the, the, yes, obviously, yes. yes, the leader role. Yeah. As a leader, you should be able to have your roles, uh, guidelines, clinical guidelines, uh, team, team functions clearly stipulated. You need to be able to empower your teams. So your team leaders, your charge nurses, your nurse coordinators, your CRNs. And if, if, if you trust that they are within the level that you want them in, usually you don't need to micromanage. Uh, because you trust that they are performing within the same level, they will, they will evaluate, they will coach, they will give uh, immediate feedback to the individuals, uh, they will escalate in a timely manner, they will provide reports. So in that situation, you, don't, you, don't, you feel comfortable enough, you feel that, okay, I, I really don't need to micromanage in that situation because I trust those. But if you feel that there is an area of improvement, then uh, as a team leader, you're still accountable for the outcome of, and the performance of your unit and your patients. And you are accountable and uh, answerable for every patient harm or safety report. And therefore, you end up uh, on the, going to that direction where you end up actually micromanaging. I'm not sure if I answered your question. Thank you, Nora. Thank you so you're, much. You're welcome. Uh, if you allow me, Nora, just I want to share uh, uh, Jazzy question. It was very interesting. It depends on the person how to define micromanagement. Because in, in management, usually there is a responsibility come with it, with the position. So will the manager ask for details, information from the foreign staff or foreign leader in the unit? That doesn't mean that she micromanage 
as long as she took responsibility for this unit. So sometimes it seems like too difficult to differentiate between this person is micromanaging me or this person is responsible enough to take responsibility for this unit. Maybe this, you know, unclear, I mean, or the fine line between those two concepts is cause this like confusion, this micromanage me or this person is responsible enough. It's, uh, thank you very much, Ms. Samira. I, actually, I, I wanted to answer Ms. Jazia, but it's not part of our agenda for the day. It's a huge topic. Uh, and yes, I agree with you. It depends on the, how, how do we define the situation. My understanding of my roles, responsibility, my limits, and uh, where, where, where should I stop and address and escalate? And uh, even if it is within my role, still I have to report. So I maybe I, I will take the full responsibility and I will manage the situation, but still I have to report and update my team leader about what happened and the outcomes and how I handle the situation. Okay, do we have any other questions or comment? So the take home message, effective communication play a key role in effective patient care. So in order to have effective patient care, we have to be mindful to clear, concise communication, ask when you are in doubt and uh, speak up if you're concerned. Exactly. Thank you very much, Ms. Maha and support each other. Uh, exactly. Uh, one of the key concepts of uh, team steps that the best team or the dream team are the team that they have each other back. Yes. And when we said each other backs, we don't mean that we hide malpractices, but we mean that we support each other, that we acknowledge our limitation, we celebrate our success, and we learn from each other. So, I believe by that we reach to the conclusion of our webinar. If there is no further questions on team steps, my advice for you guys, this is just a summary, concise summary of team steps. Team steps is a very important uh, certification for people in healthcare sector generally and leadership role and quality in particularly. So if you are interested, you can read more about it. You can enroll in a course related to team steps. I think we, we shall stop here. And I really appreciate all of you taking the time to spend two hours. And I appreciate your effort, Ms. Nora. Uh, it's a very interesting presentation. I really enjoy it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. And uh, there is no point of sh and keeping information to ourselves. We should be able to share it with everybody for, uh, for the benefit of our patient and benefit of our teams and organization. Assalamu alaikum. Walaikum salam wa shukran jazeelan. Thank you everyone. Shukran jazeelan. Walaikum salam. Thank you so much Noura. Welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Allah hafiq. Thank you Noura and Ms. Mahi.